Pakistani water and a whole bunch of our, of our uh, beverages. But we can't do it during the pandemic. We decided to give the beverages at the end of the tour. So don't worry. We're all going to be drinking Coke pretty soon. I'd like to show you these beautiful customized Coke bottles. They look a little bit different than regular Coke bottles. Here's why. During the 1996 Olympic Games, which we had here in Atlanta, some of you might remember we had the Summer Olympic Games here in Atlanta in 96. What we did was we asked uh, artists from the countries that sent us athletes to participate in the Olympic Games, we asked them to create customized Coke bottles that reflected their country's history and culture. We got 75 different Coke bottles from all around the world from various countries participating in the Olympic Games. This one is from beautiful Argentina. This one is from New York State. We got several of the United States to participate in the program. This is New York, over here. This one is Uzbekistan, but my favorite is this one. It's the biggest <laughs> and tallest bottle of all 75. Can anybody guess what country this was from? What country is this one from? Yeah. Great guess, but no. There is one. Well, there is one thing we have in common, and that is our love for Coca. Coca. Yeah, that's what we love to see. Coca. Yes. Coca. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, friends, as Paul said, and as the sign says outside, this room is called the loft. But sometimes we like to mix it up and call it the Room of Wonders. <clears throat> the reason why we like to call it that is because all of these artifacts you all see in here is telling an amazing story and showing you the journey that Coca-Cola has been through from the time it was created all the way up to now. But before we start talking about all these artifacts, we're gonna go ahead and have a quick little Coca-Cola history lesson we're going to go all the way back to 1886. That is the year that the Coca-Cola secret formula was created. And it was created by a man named Dr. John S. Pemberton. He created the formula right here in Atlanta, Georgia, at a lovely place at Jacob's Pharmacy. Funny enough, the Jacob Pharmacy building is still around to this very day. This is now a part of the Georgia State Campus. And of course, it's underneath a different name as well. But if you haven't gone past the building, you'll see a nice little plaque outside letting you know that is where it all began. Now, with that being said, for my friends in here, I have a quick question for you. Out of all of these artifacts you all see in here, which one would you all say is the oldest? And of course, since we have three groups, we get three guesses. Oh, crap. It's not me. No, it's not me. No, <laughs> someone guess Paul. Now, some people get fall, some people get me. <laughs> but yes, which artifact do you think is the oldest? Mm-hmm. It's gonna be interesting. The answer you all was looking for was this bad boy right here. Oh. The Coca-Cola syrup dispenser. That was close. Don't let the shininess fool you. I know it looks brand new, but it actually dates all the way back to 1896. Oohs and ahs, I appreciate it. Ooh. Ah. <laughs> and this is basically Coca-Cola's very first vending machine. Here's how it works. They will take the secret formula, pour it at the very top, then they spin it down at the bottom. Well, this is giving a nice spin, and it will dispense one ounce of the secret formula in your cup. Then after that, you'll just add five ounces of carbonated water into your cup, mix it up all together, and then you got yourself a nice, delicious glass of room temperature Coca Cola. Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone here like room temperature Coca Cola? I don't mind it. You don't mind it? Well, listen, friend, hey, it's okay. <laughs> we won't judge you. Right? <laughs> now, friends, here's the reason why it was always served room temperature. Reason number one originally, Coca Cola was created for medical purposes. That's why if you look at the up here, you see this sign, <clears throat> excuse me, you see the sign that says drink Coca-Cola, RX drugs. And another one over here that says drug stores drink Coca-Cola, delicious and refreshing. It was mainly used as a pain relief. So if you had a stomach ache or if you had a headache, you just drink a nice glass of room temperature Coca-Cola. 
Do you feel feeling better? <laughs> then yes. Then reason number two. A lot of people don't know this, but ice used to be a luxury item. If you wanted ice in your cup while you was out and about, well, I mean, of course you can get it, but they will charge you one cent per ice cube. That's right, one cent per ice cube. So the next time you're all out at a restaurant and you got ice in your cup, well, just think, you're the most bougiest person that you know. <laughs> Now, we gotta turn our attention over here above the exit sign. I know you see him always cool, always Coca-Cola. The one and only Mr. Polar Bear. I'm pretty sure everyone remembers Mr. Polar Bear for his famous commercials, the Northern Lights commercial with him and his cubs, sliding around, drinking Coca-Cola, etc., etc. And of course, that commercial came out in 1993. But, I can say, that was not Mr. Polar Bear's very first appearance with Coca-Cola. His very first appearance with Coca-Cola was in a French print ad in 1922. He just didn't decide to go on the big screen until 1993. And guess what, folks? Mr. Polar Bear is also here today in the building. <laughs> He's going to be super excited to meet you all and get some lovely pictures. Now, let's you in on a little secret. When you're taking pictures with him, his favorite pose is bear claws, okay? Go ahead and see everybody bear claws. All right, so Chris, he's gonna love it. Now, we're gonna talk about one more artifact before we get moving. This red bell over here, it says, drink Coca-Cola, five cents. That is how much Coca-Cola cost when it came out in 1886. And it lasted five cents for a total of 70 years. But then, the year 1956 hit, and Coca-Cola said, you know what? We gotta change the price. Friends, what do you all think they changed the price to in 1956? 10 cents. Okay, I got 10 cents. For well, my group's over here, we got a dollar, all right. <laughs> my last group. 50 cents, all right, all right. Those are all good guesses. But I go ahead and tell you, they decided to change the price from five cents to the unthinkable. Six. Six cents. I was gonna say Just that. one Dang penny it. more. A lot of people was mad, furious, and even some threatened to sue. You know what they called it? Highway robbery. <laughs> Just imagine how they will feel if they see how much we're paying it for today. I'm telling you. Now, friends, all these wonderful cutout cardboards you all see are called festoons. This was called the coldest advertisement in the 1900s. And before we had all the technologies that we have today, this was your way of knowing if your local store, pharmacy, or restaurants were selling Coca-Cola products. And I always find it pretty interesting because it's way different than how it's advertised today. Now that being said, the lights are flashing. It seems the next room is ready for you all, which is our Coca-Cola theater. In just a moment, the lights are going to flash again, and once they do, the doors will open. Once they open, you'll make your way inside and find any seats. And I go ahead and tell you, the best seats in the room are the red seats. So be sure to look for those, okay? With that being said, friends, I will meet you all in the theater. Genius chemist pharmacist. This is an impression of him actually mixing together the secret formula syrup back in 1886. This is a particularly good batch. <laughs> and Dr. Pemberton uh, grew up to upper south of us in Knoxville, Georgia. He moved to Atlanta in 1869. And he opened up his own company called the Pemberton Chemical Company. And what he did for years and years is he tinkered in his laboratory. He tried to come up with products that would be commercially viable. He came up with headache remedy. He came up with cold creams for women. He came up with hair dyes. He came up with all kinds of products. But the only product that he ever invented that was a financial and commercial success was the secret formula syrup of Coca-Cola. But in what turned out to be an example of the ferocious travesty of fate, Dr. Pemberton died just a year and a half after he created the secret formula syrup for Coca-Cola. Neither he nor his family ever made any money at all from the creation of the world's most iconic beverage. Everybody else in the historical timeline became multi-millionaires, except for Dr. Pemberton. He got sick, not from great control, but somehow. He got ill about a year and a half after he invented Coca-Cola. And on his 
deathbed, he decided to sell the company, all the shares in the company, and the secret formula to Coca-Cola to a competitor here in Atlanta for $2,300. Terrible deal, even back in 1886. To give you an idea how bad a deal it was, 20 years later, Asa Candler, the person he sold it to, would sell the company for $25 million. So that's the deal I'm looking for. You buy something for 2300 bucks, and then a couple of decades later, you sell it for $25 million. That has never happened before or since. Poor Dr. Pemberton, terrible businessman, even by his own admission, but a genius inventor. Now here's something that most people who come later today, later today there will be so many people in here, you wouldn't even be able to walk around, okay? But they never see this. They walk right in and they never come over here. Being on the VIP tour, the CIJ tour we call it, is really an advantage because there's nobody here and I can show you stuff that nobody else knows. This is the oldest item in the entire museum. We're not absolutely sure even our historians, but we believe it means to 1864. That was during the Civil War here in Atlanta, and during Abraham Lincoln's presidency, to give you an idea how very old it is. You notice it says JP, it has a JP on it, that's Dr. John Pemberton, it's my grandfather, his initials. Here's what we know about it. This is called a percolator. It's a fancy name for a mixing container. What we know for sure is that this is the container in which the first final mixture of Coca-Cola was announced. So if you're a Coke fanatic like me, okay, I work here because I like Coca-Cola, I like our products. This is the holy grail of Coca-Cola. Very first Coca-Cola ever was in here. This is the origin, the, the, the genesis of Coca-Cola right here. A very special item for us. And these are some part of uh, actual cutouts, paper cutouts from Dr. Pemberton's laboratory notebook. On these pages, you're going to see some of his formulas for headaches, remedies, and cold creams and hair dyes. But what you guys are never going to see here, ever, is the recipe for Coca-Cola. That's in the vault behind me. And guys, nobody has ever been able to figure out what's in Coca-Cola. In over 135 years, nobody's figured it out. Know what you're thinking. Scientists today, all they have to do is buy a can of Coke or a bottle of Coke, pour it in their analyzers, right? And it will isolate the ingredients exactly. It doesn't work. There is something about how our ingredients melt and fuse and how chemical reactions take place amongst the, the ingredients. Almost impossible to isolate the ingredients completely. Nobody's ever done it. Excuse me, have come close. It's never been done. Anybody remember RC Cola? RC Cola was very popular in the 70s and 80s, less so now. They used to be a real competitor. A few years ago, they made the announcement that they had figured out our formula. No, they haven't. RC doesn't taste anything like our formula. So our formula is still a secret today. And when we get into the vault, I can get you close to the formula, but I can't show it to you. Because if I did, it'd be my last day. <laughs> so here's what happened. When Dr. Pemberton created the super formula, he would sell it to these guys. He would sell it to the drugstores and pharmacies here in Atlanta. This is a soda fountain. You don't see it today. Back in 1886, when Coke was invented, this was the only way to get a Coke or any other beverage before we started bottling it. You know, we couldn't get a Coke in bottles for many, many years. The only way to get a Coke back in 1886 is you walk up to this guy at the pharmacy or drugstore and you say, hey, I've heard about this new drink called Coca-Cola. Can you make me one? And what this guy would do, he would mix a Coke together for you. The only way to do it. Dash told you about the ceramic syrup was meant for the most of the bigger pharmacies I had one of these. And by the way, these soda fountains were beautiful. They were made out of marble, onyx, gold leaf. We think this is the best preserved soda fountain in the world today. It dates to 1885. It's a real soda fountain. We found it in Toomsboro, Georgia, two hours south of us. And it's beautiful. But they weren't made really well. The outsides were beautiful, but the, the switch gear and the they weren't built so well. Do you know what we call this guy? A jerk? Yes, soda jerk. Why do we call him a soda jerk? 
Okay. Because all of the switches and pulleys were of such poor quality that when they pulled on them, they would never come out smooth. They would always kind of jerk out to make a Coca-Cola. So just the motion of making a Coke would be a jerky one. And here's what he'd do. He would take the cup, if you ordered a Coca-Cola, he'd put it under that swing right there. Also, you don't see it. It says Coca-Cola right above it. In that compartment right there, the pharmacist would put, the soda shops would put the secret form of syrup that Dr. Hamilton sold to him. So you put the cup under that so you can pull it out, and one ounce of Coca Cola syrup would come into the glass. Then they put it under that spigot right there, turn it, and you get five ounces of carbonated water, mix that together, and that's Coca Cola. Notice though, back then, the soda jerk had had ginger or cherry and chocolate. You get a chocolate coke back then. I don't think we can even get that in a freestyle machine today. You can really customize your coke with the soda jerk. We don't do it this way anymore. The closest thing to it is the freestyle machine, which you guys might do a little bit later today. And if you're on the, if you guys are on the VIP tour, I, I want to make sure you get some information that nobody else is going to get today. You guys paid a lot of money for a tour, so let's give you some real confidential info. Does anybody on the tour have any Coke memorabilia at all? I thought so. That's how we ask you to Guys, wow. Well, guys, gather close, because I really want to show you this, OK? This is, this is the most important thing on the whole tour. Right now, collecting Coke memorabilia is incredibly popular because Coke memorabilia, any old artifacts from Coca-Cola, very, very valuable. But nobody really knows what to look for, right? There's so much Coke stuff out there. What's the most valuable? What's the most collectible? Let me help you out. Maybe you guys already know this. But take a look at this clock. This clock is a typical advertising element from about 100 years ago. If you walked into a drugstore and you saw one of those on the wall, you knew they were selling Coke nearby. That's all there was to it, OK? 100 years old. But there's something not right about this clock. What's wrong with it? Something not right. It's in blue. What he does is advertise his product. And Dr. Pepperton died, and just before he passed on, he sold it to Ace and Candler. It was a good thing for the product because Ace and Candler was a businessman and knew how to market and advertise. And Ace and Candler did something, guys, that had never been done before. What he did was he added the Coca-Cola logo to items that had nothing to do with the drink. That had never been done before. Guys, today we wear t-shirts that advertise our favorite products. <laughs> but 135 years ago, nobody did it. Nobody wore a jersey with their favorite sports team, a cap with their company name. Nobody did it. So what we did was we put a Coke logo on a thermometer, on a telephone, on men shaving equipment. The guys would be shaving in the morning, and they'd look at their blade, it would say, drink a Coca-Cola, boing, subliminal message, they'd go right to the soda fountain and get a Coca-Cola. It works fantastically well. And guys, this is also a very rare color. Yep. Blue is number one, okay? But number two on the runway, yellow. This is a typical 1939 Chevrolet delivery vehicle. It was used in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And you guys ever find a cup, a plate, a calendar, a poster, anything that's yellow, getting Coke. One way, the only way to get a Coca-Cola when it first came out was to walk into a drugstore and ask the soda jerk to make it. You couldn't get a Coke in a bottle for many years. Not from 1886 to 1899. The only 13 years, the only way to get one was in the So in 1899, two attorneys from Chattanooga, Tennessee, Joseph Whitehead and Benjamin Thomas, set up a meeting with Ace and Candler. And they said, Mr. Candler, you should be bottling Coca Cola. If you bottle it, more people will buy it. Restaurants will buy cases of it. You can get it in supermarkets. You need to bottle Coke. You know what Asa Candler, the President of Coke, said? Guys, I've thought about bottling Coke, but I'm never going to do it. Never gonna do it. Why should I? I'm making millions of dollars selling it glass by glass through the soda fountain. 
I'm never going to bottle Coke, but I'll tell you what, if you bottle Coke, I'll tell you to do that. And pay for all the bottling machines and create a bottling line for me. I don't want to pay for you take it. I'll sell you the exclusive bottling rights to Coca Cola for $1. And these guys couldn't believe it. Here's the dollar that was exchanged that day. Here's the contract. Why would Asa Candler sell the bottling rights to Coca Cola for $1? Because he created the business model that we still use today. Everybody thinks we own our bottlers. We don't. We have thousands of bottlers in the world. What a deal. Every one of them needs to pay us for the concentrate, for the syrup. Nobody realizes this. That's how we've done so well. All of our bottlers need to bottlers in the community. That's how Coca Cola done so well. Now, now Asa Kettler didn't even know these guys could do it, but they did. In 1899, they created one bottling line that Coke did not pay for, and that white dot in Chattanooga had to buy the syrup from Asa Camel, the Coca syrup, to make Coca Cola. But these guys turned out to be really good. By 1920, less than 20 years later, there were 775 bottlers all around the country. Coca Cola paid for none of them. The still dot. All of these white dots need to buy the Coca-Cola syrup. And that's our basis model. That's how we do this. So a huge reveal, guys. But here's the problem. Because all the different bottlers weren't owned by Coca-Cola, they were our partners. We didn't have complete control of them back then. And they all used a different bottle in every different state for Coca-Cola. It caused all kinds of confusion. Now today we have guests from the beautiful state of Georgia. In Georgia, Columbus, Georgia, 1902, this is the bottle we were using. Notice it's a blue bottle. Oh, take blue bottle. And also, it has a label on it that makes you tell it's Coca Cola. And we also have Dominican Republic. I can't do that yet, but I will later. And we also have uh, uh, Michigan. Michigan, of course, Michigan. I did not forget. Saginaw, Michigan. Grand Rapids, Michigan. Not far. Uh, right here. Also a blue bottle because if you say Coca Cola, you get the idea. Okay, every state was using a different bottle. This caused all kinds of confusion. What Asa Kendler, the president of Coke, did was he had a big competition among all the bottlers to create the one bottle for Coke that everybody would be using. And you guys know what bottle was in confusion all over the country. This one of the earliest examples of franchising and essentially a hot tour bottle that was spent by the roof glass company of when Asa Candler saw this bottle, he stopped the competition and he said, that's it, competition is done. This is the only bottle we will ever use for Coca-Cola, but it's not our bottle. It's close, but it's too wide in the middle. We started using it before we realized it wouldn't work. It was too wide in the middle, it kept falling over. And it also was so wide in the middle that it didn't fit in all the bottling machines that these two attorneys had figured out. So what we did is we went back to the drawing board, we asked the root glass company to finesse it out, spin it out. There it is, guys. The first Coca-Cola bottle ever off the line in 1915. And this is number two on the runway for me. Number one is that percolator. That's one of the very first Coca-Cola bottles. There were two made at the same time. This is one of them. And guys, our, and that's the original mold. Our Coke bottle is so special because if you drop a Coke bottle on concrete and it bursts into 500 pieces, you walk by it and it's still instantaneous and tell it's a Coke bottle, you just can't. And if you're searching for that Coke bottle in the, in the cooler with your eyes closed, the minute you feel those ridges, you know you've got an ice cold Coca Cola. All right, we're almost done with the history, then it's going to be fun stuff. Anybody eat a restroom? Are you still okay? All right, great. Right this way. Any questions? What's that? Into the intellectual property? Yeah, I think it is today. It wasn't originally, but I think it is today. It is certainly trademarked and copyrighted. Nobody's allowed to copy it. But what we've discovered is nobody's been able to figure it out anyway, so it hasn't been an issue to us. But I believe now. This is an ad from 1954. And frankly, that 1954, they just warrants a whole lot of big American companies featuring African American families, or really families of any diverse ethnic or religious backgrounds in their ads. I'm happy to tell you that the coach has been on the correct side of the system for a long, long time. You'll notice that we've got people from 
all around the world, from all backgrounds in our advertising in the last hundred years, and we're going to keep that going. And by the way, initially, when Coke first came out in 1886, we were telling people it was good for headaches, good for energy, good for indigestion. Anybody know what? Caffeine is correct. It was the caffeine, not the other seat. It was the caffeine levels. The original Coca Cola had six times more caffeine in it than it does today. You have one ounce of it. Right? It's really good for energy. And it was also one of the most carbonated beverages of its day. So we were telling people it was good for congestion. But in the 1920s, we brought the caffeine levels down to what they are today, and we changed our strategy completely. From the 1920s until today, so for, 100, for the past 100 years, it's been a lifestyle experience, Coca Cola. Not medicine, medicinal anymore. Now, if you're drinking a Coke, you're having a good time, you're having a good life, and vice versa. That's the strategy. So, starting in the 1920s, we were featuring good looking people with perfect teeth, doing fun stuff, driving a sports car, jumping out of a plane with a parachute, all drinking a Coca-Cola, and that strategy has worked as much as the present. All right, we're almost done with history. So guys, I mentioned that Dr. Pemberton died a year and a half after creating Coca-Cola. He sells the company to Asa Candler from 2006. 20 years later, Asa Candler runs for mayor of Atlanta, and he wins. He can't run the Coca-Cola company anymore. So he sells it to a group of investors here in Atlanta for 25 billion dollars. And then we get a new president, maybe one that you've heard of before, his name is Robert Woodruff, and he ushered in a brand new era of progress, including vending machines. Now, Coca-Cola did not invent the vending machine, but we made them popular around the world. Everybody, the idea, the concept, walking up to a big metal box back in 1923, putting five cents in it, getting an ice cold Coca-Cola, brand new idea, and it works fantastically well. You guys find any of these in your local old service station, in your local antique store, you want to get it because they are incredibly valuable. And a lot of people who own the antique stores don't realize how expensive they are. Some of these could be five figures, guys. Five figures. A lot of these are in old service stations. Walk up to you guys. Hey, we're here for 100 bucks for you. My, my sister. All right. So, now, this is something that nobody sees on the regular. No, but the Tom can right there. Tom can flew on the space shuttle Challenger just six months before Challenger exploded on liftoff, as you might remember, in 1986, killing everybody on board, including the, including the school teacher, Krista McCullough, first school teacher in space. And that can flew on the previous Challenger flight that got back safely on July 12, 1985. That can was actually supposed to fly on the ill-fated January 86 flight, but we didn't get refurbished in time. We, we didn't make new cans back then. We, we updated and refurbished the space cans with a new time. We didn't get it finished in time. It didn't make the January flight, so we shouldn't even have it. That should have been destroyed and countered. And it's very special to us. That is a picture of one of the Challenger astronauts drinking out of that one. One of them, I will tell you, we beat the, uh, the evil P Empire to space for the year. Who knows what events, what worldwide events made Coca Cola a worldwide product? Yes! How do you guys know that? <laughs> I am the presence of greatness. World War II had something to do with it too, because we made sure that any soldier fighting for the Allied cause could get a Coca-Cola. So we had mobile botany facilities all around the world. If anybody fighting for the Allied cause wanted a Coke, they could get one. The Russians were fighting with us. The Australians, the British, the French, they were all introduced to Coca-Cola. But it was the Olympics. Coca-Cola has the longest corporate association with the Olympic Games of any company. And as a result, we get all the forces. <laughs> Here is our collection of the Wait, what do you guys say? Something good? Fanta? Would you say? Yes. Yeah. Nobody believes us for some reason, but it's me. It's me. 
is made out of stainless steel, titanium, and the biometric hand scanner, it works. In fact, uh oh, watch out. Matthew, they're not trying to steal the portion. <laughs> really making token here. You can see how we bottle and package our products. Now, remember, I told you that the business model at Coke is that we don't own our dollars. They're our partners. So we keep an eye on them, and we make sure they're doing it right, but they need to buy all of our concentrates mm -hmm. for our products. So that's how we've done so well. But here's the problem we have. We can control what's in our concentrates that they buy from us. What we can't control is the quality of the water around the world. That's really a problem. Some countries have very poor water quality. Some countries don't keep an eye on it the way we'd like to. And we, would, we want Coke to taste the same around the world for the most part. So what we do is even though there are partners, we don't own them, we make sure every single bottling facility everywhere around the world, even in countries that don't like us, have one of these. It's a Coke approved water treatment facility. Now, this is a really old one. We have much better ones now. They're reverse osmosis, multi barrier treatment systems. What I'm getting at here is wherever you guys buy a Coca Cola around the world, the Coca Cola company, we are really keeping an eye on the water quality. It's our number one priority. And everybody, here you go. This is how we do it. This is a filler cap where you're going to actually see how Coca-Cola is bottled around the world. But don't be fooled. This is slowed down, really slowed down. It's ultra slow motion to show you how it works. And in about, I think, five or six seconds now, you're going to see Coca-Cola being bottled. First, the syrup goes in, and then six ounces of water goes in. Mix it up, here we go. This is how we do it. So that's how we bottle Coke. But this machine is bottling coke. This machine is bottling coke at 20 bottles a minute. Okay? That's We've slowed it down so you can see it. How fast do you really think we can do it? Oh, yeah, way fast. Not 20, but how many? What, what's your guess? How many a minute do you think we can do? This is, to give you an idea, this is 20 bottles a minute. But we can do it faster. How fast do you think? I'd say minimum of 100. How many? I'd, I'd say at least 100. 100 is a great guess. Higher. 1,000? 500. 500 higher. 1,000? It's more than 1,000. 5,000? 5,000? 5,000? 3,000? very nice. It, it, oh, if it's yeah. a carbonated beverage, okay? And you guys know carbonated beverages like to, you know, fly out. You can't keep them in, right? If you pour something, it keeps up. What we have to do with the carbonated beverage is deaden the carbonation by lowering it, lowering the temperature to just above freezing. That deadens the carbonation. We do a few other things that are above my favorite grade the amp engineers do. If it's a carbonated beverage, we can now do almost 3,000 bottles a minute. And guys, this is 20 bottles a minute. 3,000 is so fast that you cannot even see it happening. If it's a non carbonated beverage, like a Dasani water or a food juice, 5,000 bottles and seven. It is alien technology. If we have had help from an, a star system outside the Milky Way on anything, it's how we buy all of our stuff. It is absolutely incredible. And you're going to see on a few videos real time bottling and canning. It's unbelievable. And here's another example of how far our syrup goes. This is a syrup tank. This is what we what we put, this is what the bottlers put the syrup in when we send it to them. This is a tiny tank. This is only a thousand gallons. Most big production lines around the world have tanks ten times bigger than this. But even a small tank like this, a thousand gallons, can make a hundred and eight thousand Coca-Cola's eight ounce per box Coca-Cola. So our syrup goes a long way. So guys, we make sure all the water is safe. We make sure all of the facilities have our syrups. And then what we do is we do one of these. We make sure they have a bottle inspector. This machine, completely automated, what this machine does is it analyzes the bottle or the can as it's coming through. 
And if there are any imperfections, any cracks, any fissures, any dents, any cuts, any cracks, it'll throw it up the line instantly. And right here, this is FizzyBot, everybody, our most advanced bottling robot. FizzyBot takes empty bottles out of a container, puts them in the bottling line, then when they're filled, finds the same bot bottles, puts them back in the box, packages it up, takes it out that garage door, puts them on a delivery vehicle. It is incredible what FizzyBot will do. Right now, FizzyBot does for Coca-Cola what Pepsi needs two robots to do. So we're a little bit ahead of them right now. That probably won't last too much longer. But we got them right now. We're very proud of FizzyBot. Mm -hmm. And then, what of course we have to do, before we put Coca-Cola or any of our drinks into a bottle or can, we have to clean the bottle or can, make it safe to, to use. We used, for many, many decades, we used hot water to clean out our bottles and cans. We don't do that anymore. What do you think we use now? We don't use water to clean our bottles and cans before we put Coke in them. What do we use? Steam. Say steam. It's air. We use deionized filtered air. We send a big, high-velocity blast of air into every bottle, can, or plastic bottle. And we've discovered something very interesting. Air, deionized air, destabilizes any dirt and particulate matter inside a bottle can even better than water. So what we're doing is we're saving billions and billions of gallons of water around the world in our bottling plants by using air instead of water to clean everything, and it works even better. And this, everybody, is our quality assurance lab. A little bit later today, there'll be a, a laboratory technician in here making sure that all these coats are tasting correct. But here is real-time bottling and canning. You see the sunny water on the left? That's a non-carbonated coat product. That's being bottled yeah. by thousand bottles a minute. And we have not slowed this, and we have not sped this up, everybody. This is real-time video. The Dasani water on the left floor monitors, 5,000 a minute. And that means the labels on the bottle, the caps on the bottle, we got 5,000 Dasani waters ready to sell every minute. That's incredible. In the middle, in just a second, you're going to see 7,000 cans of our uh, of, tea, out of our coffee products. That's one of our coffee products in the middle. And there's, uh, there's our um, iced tea products right there. And that's about 5,000. And the minute made is almost 7,000 plastic bottles a minute. So we've really figured this out. We're finally uh, producing our products faster than people can drink them around the world. So our engineers have really figured this out. And they almost never jam. One out of every 45,000 hours of production, we have any kind of jam problem, which is even better reliability than jet engines these days. So it's really pretty amazing. So what I see, real-time bottling and canning of our products. That's Coke Zero being produced. There's the sunny water again, right now. That's the best thing. All right, restroom in about one minute for anybody who needs one. But first, I want to show you this. This is a meticular map of the world. Guys, if you look at it from a few different angles, you're going to see every country on the planet, as well as a whole lot of red bottles. There you go. Can you find it? Is that where you are? Yeah. yeah. There you are. You're the Dominican Republic right there. Now, you'll notice there's a red bottle on the Dominican Republic. That means we have a bottle. So and why do they have the one in Haiti? Yes, exactly. Yes. In fact, right now, everybody, there are only two countries in the entire world that do not have a Coca-Cola bottle. Puerto Rico? Puerto Rico? No, Puerto Rico does. Right? No. It, well, this is an old one now. It does now. We definitely have not Guam. Cuba? Cuba's correct. We do not have a bottling facility in Cuba. Uh, Jamaica. No, to make we do old map. No, it's Korea. No, it's Korea. Korea. Do you work for Coke? No. <laughs> very nice. You really know your stuff. And you all do, but you, you've had a couple of really good questions and really good answers. You, you've been here before, though, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Very good. But, but North Korea, we've never been able to make a deal with the North Koreans. Our previous president tried to, Kim Jong-un, but it didn't work. We did not want Coca-Cola officially in the country. And Cuba 
prior to Castro in 1959, we had a bottling facility there. We don't now. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't get Coca-Cola in North Korea or Cuba. It means that we're not putting it there, okay? So if you guys go to lunch in Havana, Cuba, yeah. and you order a Coke, yeah. you're going to get some. But we can't be sure what it is. You might get a Venezuelan Coke. You might get a Mexican Coke. You might get a Coke from Haiti or Dominican Republic. You might. We don't know. Or you might be getting something that the Castro family is mixing up in their garage. So don't do it. <laughs> Wait until we are officially in North Korea and Cuba before you order a Coke there. But anywhere else, it's good to go. Okay, you guys have been so patient. Restrooms in the corner. If anybody needs one, and then we go right upstairs. No? You guys, you're good.